And so your conscious mind is more the press secretary of your mind. It's a it's more trying to put together a story that it can present to other people and less trying to actually figure out why you're doing stuff. Wow. Can we live authentically then? Well, the question is what is authentic? So if you look at okay. Okay. recent like studies and things like it looks like people feel the most authentic when they can present a view of themselves that other people would like and admire. <laughs> That's what authentic means to people. <laughs> it's not the real me the, real, the authentic <laughs> is the me i can present that people will like and that's the real me okay so people basically when there's you know conflicts and you can look at that person and say they seem to be a contradiction sometimes they act like this and sometimes that like that we agree oh yeah i'm a contradiction i have these different aspects and i'm pick the part the the part of all those contradictions that you would like best and i say well that's the real me <laughs> Those other parts, well, they're just fake me's and they're going to go away when the real me takes over. So please help the real me win here. Following on Seekers Mind Talks is a conversation with Robin Hansen. He is one of those fun, fearless and interesting polymath minds out there. He is a professor of economics at George Mason University and has written two books. One, The Elephant in Our Brain, which discusses the human psychology about why we do the things we actually do, and the second one, a book called The Age of M, which describes a future human society run by brain emulations. So that's like people existing in the internet. So kind of like Ultron from the Marvels. In our conversation, we started with the elephants in our brain and how we can identify them. to better our lives and how these are affecting human culture and how the human culture is evolving in a globalized world and how all these are affecting our national level and international level institutions if you like the show don't forget to nurture us with your likes and comments and a subscribe for the algorithm i'm your host raj and please enjoy the conversation with robin on the seekers mind talks how important is free thinking for we as humans or as a society for the present and for the future well you could say there it's important for us to figure many things out mhm many things that matter and then we could ask how useful is free thinking to figuring things out so sometimes free thinking is just treated as a license to like go anywhere you like with thoughts or ideas and uh um, you know to push back on any criticism because hey it's free thinking um now you know there are definitely situations where you know people are stuck in a certain set of topics or uh, positions and maybe they have conformity pressures to prevent others from you know considering a wider range of options and then it would be helpful in those situations for people to resist those conformity pressures to consider a wider range of other things mhm but often people take on the free thinking mantle as uh basically they justify it in terms of that scenario but then they don't actually do the work <laughs> to figure out you know other positions and to think of that them carefully they just think they should get credit for just saying things that are different and unfortunately that gives a bad name to the whole enterprise of trying to break out of the usual conformity pressure because they don't do a good job <laughs> you know they just want credit for their creativity so this is a problem in general even with creativity mm-hmm. i mean there are many situations where you know powerful creativity would be helpful but then some pe- see some people who have trouble doing the usual thing <laughs> they have trouble just being reliable and showing up on time and remembering things they take this alternative strategy where they say ah well yeah other people do the usual thing but i am a free thinking creative type and so i'm going to be do these different things and you should give me credit because even though i'm not doing the usual thing which i can't really handle <laughs> I'm doing right. this other thing and so hey you should you know respect me and and give me resources and jobs and everything like that because look I'm doing this creative thing except they're not willing to be held to the standard of well did you actually do something interesting <laughs> with that mm-hmm. alternative view if it's just you want credit for being different somehow that's way too low a bar it's way too easy just to be different 
and not be very useful at it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you want to do is give people credit for doing things different or thinking different when they make some progress with it. And then you want to give right. them extra credit for that because, yeah, they took some extra work to break out of the usual frames to do something different that actually was useful and mattered. But you don't want to just give people credit for just doing something different. Mm -hmm. you, you know what we humans are? We are terrible listeners. We have so much ego. And most of the time, we don't want to listen. But that's where I think the idea is more, 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 more compassionately acceptable. Because when you have that sort of a mindset, it what it actually is, is getting into the other person's mind and trying to figure out what the other person wants to see so that you break out from your own thought patterns. It's definitely a problem that people often don't listen enough. On the other hand, it's not good to just listen to anybody about anything. <laughs> <laughs> so you want some, you know, judgment and standards about who you listen to when, and then you'd like to make yourself listen. Um, so for example, I am an economist. Uh, trained as an economist among economists, and academic disciplines tend to listen too little to other disciplines. So I try to make sure I go read sociology and anthropology and political science and even psychology in order to understand the things these other fields have to say that my field doesn't, that we neglect because it's a lot of work to go listen to other disciplines. But that doesn't mean you just want to read random stuff. <laughs> Random stuff, say on the internet, blogs, whatever, random tweets, they're not actually very useful. They're, they're, they're a distraction. They're, they're going to waste your time. Mm -hmm. So uh, you shouldn't give yourself credit for just reading random crap. <laughs> you should hold yourself to a high standard and try to listen carefully to the best of stuff that you would otherwise be reluctant to listen to because, you know, it takes a different vocabulary to understand or it's a different style or different ideologies are mixed up with it. You know, take how, how, the how, how, how do we separate that from, how do we separate information from noise? Well, uh, the simplest standard thing humans do is prestige. <laughs> that is, prestige is a concept of shared evaluation uh, people are prestigious to the degree that there's a widely shared high rating of them. That's what it means to be prestigious. And one of the core strategies of human culture <laughs> is to pay more attention to the prestigious. Hmm. So um, that's a simple metric right there. I should listen to prestigious sociologists and anthropologists and political scientists say uh, that's one way to cut down. Now, it's not the only thing you have, but it's it's a nice first cut and it's very mm -hmm. standard. Um, in addition, you can, like, when you read something by somebody and it seems insightful and, um, you know, has value, then you can read other stuff by them or other stuff in that same literature, other stuff in the same style, using the same methods. You can just, once you have anchored on some particular examples of things, you go, well, that was interesting, that was insightful then look around nearby that thing. Right, right, right. That's good. Uh, what's the mind of a polymath like? Um, I think most fundamentally, uh, the mind of a polymath isn't a disciplinary mind, i.e. someone who thinks of themselves as, I'm an economist, so I should stay in my lane and only read economics. <laughs> and if it looks like it's not economics, I should, I should stop there because this is my lane and this is what I'm supposed to do. So now, so most ordinary people are polymaths in that sense. <laughs> most ordinary people just have thoughts and things they think are interesting and, and they pursue those thoughts using whatever mental tools they have. Um, and then there's this disciplinary mind that's more of a constructed thing by society where people learn to stay in their lane. They learn that you are an X <laughs> and you should read about X and learn about X and not go outside of X. Um, now, most people who are not disciplinary are not actually very insightful or effective. So, I mean, the interesting polymaths are the ones who are effective, i.e. who actually get insight. And so we might ask, well, what distinguishes them from all the other non-specialists? So, right. you know, an economist, an X, one of the things that distinguishes them is if I'm an economist, 
I've spent a lot of time learning about economics, and I feel that I met some standards of how well I understand it, and then I'm able to apply it. And so I'm not just an ordinary person who just has opinions on the subject. I, I have learned a fair bit about it. And that authorizes me and, and a, enables me to make progress on those topics in the way that another person could. So now if we think about a polymath, a polymath is more going to be someone like that, except less with the field boundaries. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, that means maybe they've learned several fields to the standard of an expert in that field, and so are able to sort of move fluidly between these fields. It's not just that they're an amateur who knows nothing, and now they're a polymath. I don't think that quite counts for a polymath. I think to count as a polymath, you should be someone who is sufficiently expert in several fields that you could make contributions to those fields individually, but then you're also able to move between them and then maybe combine them. Look at ways in which, you know, combining a piece from here and a piece from there allows you to get an insight just like within a field, you can combine things. And that's sort of more the essence of a polymath, <laughs> somebody who knows several fields well enough to contribute and can, can combine them and move, move between them more in the way an ordinary person moves between the fields because they aren't an expert in any one field. Do, do you think we make more connections and uh, advancements, so to speak, so that we have a polymath mind because we are connecting different fields? Usually what happens is a person settles his career on a specific field and it's, is it everybody's piece of cake to be a polymath? Uh, it seems not. <laughs> um, Can we train ourselves? Well, it's, it's, I would think of it as more of a particular intellectual strategy that is matched well with a particular personality style or particular you know, mental style. So that means it's not necessarily well suited for everyone and not necessarily recommended for everyone. We don't want everyone taking all possible intellectual styles. Mm -hmm. So the polymath style will be someone who is able to learn several different fields. They, they, don't, they don't run out of their ability to learn when they learn just one field. They are still able to learn many different fields and they are willing to take the time to do that. And then the polymath strategy is going to pay off in terms of those connections uh, between things. That's going to be the payoff. That is, you, if, if in working in a particular area, all you really needed was things near that area, there wouldn't be much of a payoff from you learning lots of other areas to work on an area. You should just focus right on that one particular thing. The payoff of learning many areas is that you might be able to combine them. That's the interesting thing, right? Like the connections are exponential. And you might not know what you get out of the genie from the lamp. But that sort of helps you see the time structure uh, of the career path of a polymath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a polymath's going to have to start out learning one field first. <laughs> yeah, I was reading okay. your post on Substack that polymaths are late bloomers. Right. So um, you don't, I mean, obviously everybody starts up just knowing lots of different things, but not that much about lots of different things. And at some point you'll learn enough about one field to contribute mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And then the distinction will be then some people will learn multiple fields <laughs> and be able to contribute to them and combine them. But that will take time to add those fields over time. And so uh, the payoff, though, will come from having more fields and combining them. And so that payoff grows with the number of fields you have learned and are able to combine. And so that grows with time. So this is why it's a late blooming strategy is, uh, you know, at your, some point, like at my age, I'm 64. If I've learned, you know, a dozen fields then I can combine all of them. And then I'm much better at noticing connections <laughs> when I come across any one new thing. It's really exciting, right? In proportion right? to the number of things I've learned. <laughs> it's really exciting, right? When you make those neural connections that not necessarily happen otherwise. Well, the exciting thing, hopefully, is to get insight. Mm -hmm. And when you get insight by combining fields, they will tend to be relatively fundamental insights, right? It's not, it's not going to be some surface little thing you figure out. It's going to be more a way of thinking about a whole area that you'll get by combining things. So you're going to hopefully get more deep insight into whatever you're looking at by these 
other related fields. And that's what should excite you. <laughs> if, if you're not excited by insight, then I guess this just isn't a game for you. We are masters of self-deception. Why do we have the elephants in our brain? We are social creatures. <laughs> and uh, our main environment is each other. Uh, that is, our human ancestors, when they lived together in a small group, that small group was really quite well protected against the outside world and relatively safe, but not so much against each other. <laughs> so the, the each other was the main environment that mattered. So that was the main evolutionary pressure on our ancestors was how to manage each other, how to live among each other. And one of the key things was to look good to each other. <laughs> uh, to be impressive to each other, to be prestigious for each other. So we evolved to pay a lot of attention to impressing each other and putting on a good show and, and making each other believe in us. And humans have these norms by which there's things you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And so it ended up being very important that we are able to give the impression that we are following the norms and not violating the norms. And... All of these things are often encoded in terms of motives. That is, when people are trying to judge if they're impressed or like us, or whether we violated a norm, a lot, it often matters what they thought our motive was in some situation. Hmm. And so that's why we pay a lot of attention to managing the appearance of our motives. We want to seem to have good motives. So for example, if I hit you on purpose, that's a big norm violation. If I accidentally hit you, it's not. <laughs> so if I hit you, I definitely want to give the impression that I didn't mean it. Uh, it was an accident. And so I want to manage the impression I give about motives. So in fact, most of us, most of the time, are sort of looking at what we're doing and looking at how that might appear to other people and trying to put together a story about how what we're doing had these motives that would be a good story for other people. Like we had kind motives and generous motives and, and hardworking motives. We were... We were well motivated, even if things went wrong. And that's just a thing that's going on in our brain all the time. We're always making sure we have a story about what we've been doing and why it was okay and, and not a bad thing. And it's, these motive yeah, stories we generate don't have to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, your conscious mind is less about knowing what you're really doing and more about managing the show, managing the story you'll tell other people about what you've been doing and why. And so your conscious mind is more the press secretary of your mind. It's a, it's more trying to put together a story that it can present to other people and less trying to actually figure out why you're doing stuff. Wow. Can we live authentically then? Well, the question is, what is authentic? So if you look at okay. Okay. recent like studies and things like it, it looks like people feel the most authentic when they can present a view of themselves that other people will like and admire. <laughs> <laughs> That's what authentic means to people. <laughs> it's not the real me. The, real, the authentic <laughs> is the me I can present that people will like, and that's the real me. Okay. Because <laughs> people basically, when there's you know conflicts and you can look at that person and say, they seem to be a contradiction. Sometimes they act like this and sometimes they act like that. We agree, oh yeah, I'm a contradiction. I have these different aspects and I pick the part, the, the part of all those contradictions that you would like best. And I say, well, that's the real me. <laughs> those other parts well they're just fake me's and they're going to go away when the real me takes over so please help the real me win here <laughs> that's your story to other people is that they should like the real you and the real you is more the fundamental you that will last into the future and, and more the thing that will win out over the other ones and the real you is whatever they like best Maybe it's that selfish gene that's acting right Richard Dawkins selfish gene that just wants to Make sure that we, we, we develop course. that progeny. I mean, what he meant by the selfish genes is that they're all selfish. <laughs> he didn't mean that there was one particular gene inside you that was selfish and the rest were not. He meant all your genes are selfish, <laughs> i.e. your whole system was designed to be selfish. All of the genes are working together to be selfish. That's one other thing I wanted to ask you. Is there something called a selfless act? There are other oriented acts. Mm -hmm. There are there are definitely acts that we do that are designed to help other people. Yeah, but still we're getting that feeling of we get help righteousness, too. right? But that is, you know, we aren't really going to be doing things that 
don't achieve our long-term interests, at least in terms of expectation of the genes, <laughs> but some of those things could be in other people's interests. So <laughs> we do actually care about other people. That is, we aren't indifferent to the people around us. We have allies and mates and, and children and other people in our world that we actually want to, to do well. But still, in some sense, we can think that we are doing it for that feeling of neurotransmitters getting released when I do that charity act or or love or emotion in that in that sense it's also for me am i right or to think in that sense well, or i mean basically evolution you know selected for behaviors that would make your genes survive but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your genes are different maybe than you so for example you could you know give up your life to save your children and that's a other oriented act that hurts yourself, but it promotes your genes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can see why evolution would have produced it, but you can also see why it's worth naming and it distinguishing it as a the opposite. If you had just, you know, given up your children to save yourself, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be different. It's worth noticing that that's different. But the idea is that evolution is going to consistently promote behaviors yeah. that have a certain end, i.e. your genes, and, but there can be selfish versions of promoting your genes and less selfish yeah. versions, so. The other thing, I like to think of it as primary and secondary selfishness, you know. <laughs> but people uh, have this strong feeling that they want to hold themselves to standards, they want to be among uh -huh. people, and so that's one of the things that got selected for, uh, especially through cultural evolution, is humans having moral norms and um, that we admire people who follow the moral norms and we denigrate and dislike people who don't follow the norms. And we each want to live up to that standard of being the person who follows the norms. And we want to be proud of ourselves if we manage to get ourselves to do that. <laughs> um, that's part of who we are. And so we will often make substantial sacrifices of other things to be the sort of person who lives up to our principles. What, what do you think will happen to humans if we didn't have to cooperate? Like in a hypothetical situation where I didn't have to cope or a person didn't have to cooperate, will still our behavior be the same? I mean, cooperation is a huge part of our nature and our practices. So mm -hmm. trying to imagine the counterfactual of a non-cooperative human is just really hard. <laughs> it's really far from... <laughs> yeah, it's just are. a thought experiment. It's just something right. that came to but me you right now. You have to realize the, the, <laughs> the more you go to a fundamental feature of us and you say, what would it be like without that? The harder it is <laughs> to answer that question. If, if you just ask to ch about a small change, what if you were <laughs> one inch shorter or something like or one inch taller? Okay. You could work out how things might be different with a small change, but the bigger a change you make, the harder it is to figure out how things would be different. Because, and this is one of those things that's really fundamental. Hmm. Are there any solitary animals that? Well, of course. I mean, there are definitely animals that spend most of their life being solitary, and then mainly only, you know, as children, you know, they they mate for a short time and then the mother takes care of children until the children leave and then you know they don't see each other until they mate again etc so there are animals like that hmm. interesting thought uh i don't know if it's this this is true but i was reading through your wiki page and saw that you opted to preserve your brain is that true i am a cryonics customer i.e um I what have, is that that means that uh wow i will you know, this basically says that if you find me in a medically difficult situation, you should call these people and they will try to arrange to have my head frozen. Uh, and, and the idea there is that yes. if you freeze my head in liquid nitrogen and you keep it frozen indefinitely, that it just won't change it. That is the rate of chemical reactions at a very low temperature is extremely low. So it could sit there for centuries and hardly not change at all. And then, you know, centuries later, when technology is much better, it may be possible to create what I call a brain emulation uh, in my book, The Age of M, i.e. to make a computer model of the brain and turn that model on. And then from my point of view, I wake up and I'm alive and can live more life again. 
You well, love life so much. You well, love most life people so do. Much. <laughs> uh, it's just whether they think of this as something that might work and whether they think this sort of world would be a world they're willing to live in. So many people like the world they're in, but they balk at living in a very different world. So sometimes mm -hmm. people have been willing to make big changes in their lives in order to keep living or to find a better life. Immigrants often do that, but many people don't emigrate. <laughs> they stay home because they didn't want to make big changes. And so that might be understandable. Well, what do you want to do when you come back? Because I've heard like infinity is a curse. Well, I mean, infinity is not anything you see looking at any particular spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, immortality is like a crazy long thing. Uh, it seems crazy. I mean, I don't believe I would experience immortality. I believe I might experience a much longer life. But I also mm -hmm. believe that if it turns out I didn't like it, I could quit. That's an option for people today True. and <laughs> yeah. remain an option for me in the future. So um, I'm not so much worried about what happens if I don't like it. I, I quit. Um, I am more worried now, though, about whether this is going to work because mm. I now forecast a coming centuries long innovation pause. Oh, OK. Um, and unfortunately, brain emulation probably won't be feasible before that pause. So world population mm. is rising at the moment, but fertility is falling. Uh, most places it's below fertility within a couple decades, it'll be below fertility most everywhere. And so world, world population will start to fall as as it does, the economy will shrink. And with a shrinking economy, innovation rate goes down. And uh, when the population falls by a large enough factor, basically the innovation rate will have fallen by even a larger factor. And so innovation will grind to a halt. And that'll start, that process will start in a few decades. And so that pause could go on for many centuries. That is, and so the, if we don't get human level AI or brain emulations by this pause, then we won't get it until after the pause because we don't get much innovation during the pause. That's a problem. <laughs> So now, if th there's this alternative technology that's, you know, been demonstrated, but unfortunately not commercialized, that you could do what's called plastination, or basically infusing my head with plastic, mm -hmm. so that there was still also no chemical reactions, but now you could store it at room temperature. And I now I, th I think that could last for a few centuries. <laughs> you could stick that in a hole in the ground somewhere and dig it up in a few centuries, and it would still be fine. The problem is when they're when stormy at liquid nitrogen temperatures, that requires a social infrastructure of support to keep that going. And having that go for centuries is a big ask. So mm. that's a problem. So I'm, I'm disappointed <laughs> that we <laughs> may now there's a, there's a chance we would, you know, over get around this problem by, say, achieving human level AI before this pause or brain emission before this pause or maybe preventing the pause by reversing fertility decline. There are some chances there. So I'm not going to give up entirely on chronics because Is of it that, food? But is it food? Is it the food we eat? What no. is the cost? Um, so in general, you can describe causes of things at different levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most fundamentally, the cause of fertility decline is individual parents choosing not to have kids. <laughs> um, but if you move back in the causal chain from that, you could say there's a number of social trends that are all, you know, causing these choice. Uh, these social trends include uh, trends toward more intensive parenting. The standards of how much attention you pay to kids have gone up. Trends toward uh capstone rather than cornerstone marriage, whereas in the past you would have married young and when you're still plastic and unformed and, and don't know where you succeed. And now the idea is you should wait until you have career success and know just who you are and then pick a partner that matches that as a capstone of life rather than a cornerstone. Uh, there's long inflexible career paths now compared in the past, less involvement of grandparents in uh, parenting. A whole bunch of social trends are all um, making people less likely to have kids. Uh, gender equality is another, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but if we go back even farther in the causal chain, I think we could say the fundamental problem here is a lack of cultural innovation. So let me explain. 
if you look at species, um, there's innovation within species and innovation between species. Okay. <laughs> places okay. like land and rivers where species are more fragmented and smaller have less innovation within the species, but more innovation between the species, innovation mm -hmm. of species. And it turns out that second kind of innovation matters more. <laughs> that the places where like land and rivers, which are more fragmented, have on over time given rise to more overall innovation in life. So oh, okay. it and another analogy is is firms. Uh, at, you know, in our world today, we each firm innovates within the firm. That is, firms figure out better things to do and they get better at things. And there's innovation between firms, i.e. bad firms are replaced by good ones. Mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. second kind of innovation is also more important. <laughs> that is, more innovation is driven by the fact that we replace bad firms with good ones than that the fact that inside firms they get better. So mm -hmm. we have these units, i.e. species and firms, each of which can have innovation within it, inside it, and also innovation between it of those units. And it turns out innovation of the units matters more. So now if we get to culture, the driving force of human change for, you know, a million years has been cultural evolution, whereby we don't need to change our DNA to change our practices. We instead change our practices through culture. And so that has two levels of innovation. There's innovation within a culture, i.e. given a culture, people, you know, invent new things and have new habits and practices and spread them among each other. And then there's innovation of cultures okay. whereby different <laughs> cultures replace each other. Culture could you know, basically specify social norms and who is how prestigious and what are the prestigious markers and also who's the markers of who's in and or out of our culture. So that's what a culture is. And for culture, we also have these two levels, innovation within the culture and innovation between cultures. And mm -hmm. up until a few hundred years ago, uh, basically, most people were peasants living in small groups, and basically we had like 100,000 or more cultures around the world of all these little peasant groups who each had their own definition of being in and out and their own norms and their own status hierarchy. And then in the last few centuries, we, we had two big moves. One is to create nation states by merging these small peasant cultures into a national culture. And that was a big, powerful force in the world, and it definitely made nations better able to fight wars and had more internal national economic growth and development. And the second development was in the, in the last century, we've created a, a global culture where especially global elites merged together into a global mm. elite culture. And so now we have vastly fewer cultures than we did a few centuries ago, from hundreds of thousands down to a handful. And that meant that in that process, we now are much better at having within culture innovation. This has unleashed vast, faster innovation of, you know, making machines and um, how to arrange a city and how to arrange your daylight, daytime, you know, life and all these, all these little things that are allowed to change within culture have been, you know, the rate of innovation has gone way up there because we've merged all these small cultures into a few really big ones. But we also have much less innovation of cultures. Mm. And so now cultures have just drifted. So there's, we apparently have pretty strong cultural drift processes. So cultures okay. don't just sit and remain static. Their norms and values, uh, their status markers, their who's in or out markers, uh, those things change substantially over short time scales. That's what we call social change. <laughs> Uh, okay. Many people are pushing for it, activists or whatever, trying to push in different directions for these changes. But the main point is there's a lot of it. There's a lot of these change in the culture. When we had 100,000 cultures, we also had this sort of change, but we had selection to discipline it. That is, when some little local peasant group would go off the rails in terms of its, you know, norms or status markers or whatever else it would be, it would just be then quickly outcompeted by neighboring places because they were all near subsistence level and had lots of war, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. small. And so selection was the discipline that kept cultures in check, even though they had all these sort of random ways they would drift. Uh, selection kept the overall distribution of cultures roughly functional. But now that we've merged a few very big cultures who are rich, they okay. go off and drifting and there isn't much discipline to, 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 to rein them in. They just go wandering off. And so that's my distal explanation for fertility decline is just 
we've just allowed our yeah. culture to randomly walk in the space of possible cultures and happens to go away from we're systemizing so, everything and that systemic approach is kind of degrading the differences in us what we are merging together into a unified world culture <laughs> and that has many advantages like it reduces war it makes it easier to move people around the world and put them in different roles it makes it easier to communicate it makes it easier to have world markets for things there's lots of big advantages from having one big world culture but we haven't noticed the disadvantage that the things that culture shares like our norms about parenting and our norms about gender and our norms about death and all sorts of work and all sorts of things like our norms and our status markers and our membership markers for all these things are just allowed to drift without selection reining them in and that's what's been happening and i think for fertility decline is just one indication of that it's just one of many things that such a drift would cause presumably are getting drift not just in fertility but elsewhere but the fertility is a very dramatic example of you know so again parenting standards they've they've drifted upwards they didn't have to <laughs> but they did and now we feel we're immoral unless we put huge amount of attention for each kid in a way that we didn't 50 years ago or a century ago if you look at like movies from the 1930s or 40s or something watch parents dealing with kids <laughs> They're hardly paying any attention. Really, they are. They don't notice it. The kids don't care, but they are not paying very much attention to the kids. And we would consider that sort of immoral now, but that's just a way in which our culture has drifted from mm. where it was. And that's a fundamental thing you should expect from a world with just one big culture or a small number of cultures that are closely tied. We know selection no longer disciplines that drift. They just wander off in various random directions. And here we are. Come so on, guys, is, it's basic. Just play to survive. That's it. <laughs> we are not struggling to survive. That's, I mean, because we're rich and at peace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the main mechanisms that used to, you know, impose selection pressures aren't there. So our world culture is all wandering randomly. And, but there will be this long term selection pressure. That is, if we wander into the low fertility, parts of cultural space, population will just decline <laughs> relative to cultures that defy the world culture. So there are still a few cultures in the world which are insular, i.e. they have big walls around them and they defy the world culture. They say, no, we're not listening to you. We're not going to follow you. We're just going to have our own different <laughs> approach. And some of those are very fertile and very okay. fragmented, and which is exactly what you should expect from this cultural model. The cultural model says the big, huge cultures they're going to all go together. But if there's any little fragmented cultures that are insular, well, they can have cultural evolution and they do. They do have the, that's where the high fertility is. Who are they? Do you have an example? Well, for example, the Amish. Okay. In the U.S., the Hutterites, the mm -hmm. Haredi Jews in Israel. Um, there's a number of others, small, and they tend to be fundamentalist, religious, rural, uh, pacifist. <laughs> there's very small groups, very insular. Mm. And they have very high fertility and have maintained it for a long time. So, for example, the Amish have doubled every 20 years for the last century mm -hmm. uh, or even longer, which is roughly what the Christians did. So the Roman Empire also had a fertility problem and its population <laughs> declined over many centuries because of its fertility problem. And it was over time replaced by Christians who were doubling every 20 years. Christians started out being a very tiny fraction of the Roman Empire. They just over three centuries could double every 20 years who eventually take over the Roman Empire. And wow. that's the kind of future we're looking at here. The Amish or other groups will just slowly take over if our mainline culture <laughs> declines and they keep growing like they have. So humanity won't go extinct, thankfully. But, that's interesting but then, you know, later on, yeah. will they produce, you know, larger emerging cultures and technology and repeat the whole cycle again? So mm. unfortunately, humanity has this big Achilles heel we're tempted as we get rich and powerful to communicate a lot, to travel a lot, to merge together into a large merged world culture, which then goes off the rails, population declines, and then it gets replaced by another smaller, fragmented, less lower technology culture who then goes through a similar cycle. Huh. So maybe a solution is maintaining your cultural integrity and maintaining a friendly competition. 
Right. So one obvious solution is to try to m maintain much higher degrees of cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. And not, by this cultural diversity, we don't just mean different food styles and dress and holidays or something. We mean different fundamental values, including about things like fertility and death and gender equality mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. That is, if we were more militant about promoting and allowing strong cultural diversity, then we might be able to, you know, continue to grow because at least some of those cultural diverse things would have high fertility. And basically, we would have sufficient selection pressures to, you know, keep culture healthy from an evolutionary point of view. But that goes against a lot of pretty strong feelings. So I, I did a, some a polls a few a week ago or so where I asked people about different kinds of diversity, whether they wanted more or less of each kind of diversity. And um, basically, people wanted a lot of diversity of business and they wanted a lot of diversity of music. And they went a lot, but the thing they wanted the least diversity in and was fundamental values. No, they do not like the idea that there's diversity in fundamental values. That's the worst possible diversity to have. Out of 12 different kinds of diversity, it was the one that people wanted the least, and they did not like it at all. But of course, that's the kind of diversity you need if you're going to have deep multiculturalism, i.e., variety in not just surface features of cultures, but their fundamental values. So that's what we're up against. It, you know, mm. we would have to somehow change people's attitudes toward diversity and fundamental values. And that looks like a really big ask. <laughs> Actually, it looks easier to solve the fertility problem in other ways, but we wouldn't solve <laughs> the cultural problem in other ways. We would just put off those other cultural problems because maybe fertility is the biggest mm. problem that it's caused so far, but it's likely to cause other problems. If we don't solve it. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. Coming back to elephant in the brain, uh, what's your idea about Maslow's law of hierarchy? Because I think it's directly correlated to resources, and and the lesser you're down that, the more animalistic you become. I'm not sure how true it is. <laughs> so the Maslow's hierarchy concept is that we focus on survival when we are poor. Mm -hmm. And as we get richer, we can focus on higher needs, like self-actualization mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But poor people put an awful lot of effort <laughs> into um, symbolic needs. That is, our poor ancestors paid a lot of attention to impressing each other uh, and you know, wanting to seem to have high motives and, and wanting to have other people like them, even for our very poor ancestors, that was a big part of their lives and a big part of their motives. So it's just not clear to me that people actually move that much farther toward higher motives. Now, definitely when you're rich, you can just afford to be, say, making art that has very little to do with the world of your functionality. You can just you know, focus on travel and art and arguing about things that doesn't do much directly for your survival. Mm -hmm. But in the past, when people did have to spend much of their time on survival, they still, as they could, directed it toward these other purposes. That is, people would arrange their furniture and their clothes to try to, you know, to have the right symbols and the right images, even if they couldn't afford that much of in terms of clothes spend their free time telling stories and singing songs and, you know, bonding with the community through rituals. Even if they were very poor, uh, they'd still have some free time to do that. So humans have pretty much always done a lot of things pretty high up the Maslow hierarchy. Hmm. Hmm. I was reading through your blogs and I found the idea that you wrote of Tim Urban's book, the what's wrong with us i think it was about the higher brain and the higher mind and the lower mind right is this do you remember um no you'll have to tell me more which okay is higher the, mind or can you higher mind title? and lower mind tim urban he's called tim, tim urban oh i see uh, yeah right. yeah he wrote this book right i think it's it's called what's wrong with us right right I so i love that guy because he he I I think he's a good teacher Cultural because he can problem. I guess yes 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 that's right, and uh, about the the idea about a higher mind and a lower mind. I think that's 
a bit of an oversimplification, mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. I tried to talk yeah. about in my re book review. Um, yes. So it's, it's, I mean, unfortunately, people often want to make this sort of flattering distinction. There's the good part of us and the bad part of us. <laughs> and uh, we just need to help the good part of us win over the bad part of us. And he's got a certain story of the good versus the bad. And uh, I less think there is such a distinction. There is just the main part of us who we try to spin as good in certain ways. And, you know, in some sense, it's just not true. Um, but I, I mean, I, we really are compared to most animals good in many of the ways that we value. <laughs> we are very cooperative. We are very helpful to each other. We do have higher aspirations and we do achieve them a lot. We just aren't the angels. We like, we try to pretend, but I think compared to all the competition out there, <laughs> we deserve some respect and we are pretty admirable. So, uh, I think, I mean, I, I'm not, someone who's against humanity or disapproves of humanity or thinks humanity is ugly. I like humanity and I like what we've done and I like where we're going. Um, I just think we are so eager to spin an even more positive story about ourselves that if you're going to be honest, you have to say, well, that doesn't quite work. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but what we actually are is pretty cool. Humans are amazing. Uh, coming back to the competition, you, you said that culture is integrating and everything is becoming one. And what do you think about the monopoly that's happening in technology? So, right. So like Instagram or Facebook or, or, or there's very less competition there. Seems like there's plenty of competition to me. Oh, I mean, okay. You know, at, the, at the moment, for example, just yesterday, the U S house of representatives passed a bill to try to force TikTok to be sold to American companies because they don't like the competition of foreigners owning a social media company. Uh -huh. That's competition. They're trying to stop the competition by law here in this bill. And, you know, basically, as long as lots of people can start these media companies and uh -huh. those companies can go in different directions, I think we have a fair amount of competition. Huh. Well, what about business acquisitions? Because I think that's a mainstream thing that's going on. Is that's it true? It's been going on for a very long time. And so yeah. I'm an economist. And the point uh -huh. is, uh, basically, you know, people invent alternatives to existing businesses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those alternatives can grow at the expense of the existing business. And sometimes existing business try to buy them to try to limit that, but then new ones appear. And, you know, it's a never ending battle to try to buy off competition. And you know, every time you pay a lot for some competition and it indices other people to try to make more competition so they can get bought off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, basically big tech firms paying a lot for competition is one of the major engines that drives other people to make more firms to try to compete because they're mm -hmm. open for that big payout of being bought off. So mm -hmm. we've got a lot of tech competition and we'll continue to get a lot of tech competition. I mean, you know, obviously going against that is scale economies which are real and you shouldn't be ignored. That is, you know, net, there's network effects from many sites like Facebook or Twitter, i.e. the more people are there, the more other people want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And that's a real value. And so that's an effect that's going to limit the number of them because people don't want to join some tiny network. They want to join a big network. Right. Same way for AI, say recently, there's just a scale economy of having enough data and enough processors or whatever to do big AIs. So if you were to force, you know, smaller firms, you'll get less of that scale economy in all of these industries. And that's driven tech for a long time, these scale economies. But that's been part of the world economy for a long time, scale economies. And, you know, there you, you should want more concentration in industries which have more scale economies because that makes stuff cheap for the rest of us. Hmm. Um, as long as it doesn't get too much competition, concentration, but it won't be too much concentration as long as you let other people enter. When you empower government to prevent competition, <laughs> that's when you get strong monopolies. Hmm. But what people are often trying to do as the solution to seeing too much competition is to empower government to prevent competition. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, come on, guys. You know, you're being tricked here. Like somebody's <laughs> telling you they're protecting you against somebody else, something else, while actually being the thing that's causing the biggest problem. Hmm. Ah, uh, okay. I want to ask this question now. Like, what what percent is a government 
run by a business like wo- how much does business have its effects on a government um well so most governments in the world are democracies <laughs> okay okay and a standard liter- i mean obviously one way government businesses can try to influence government is by donating money paying mm-hmm. money to mm-hmm. candidates to influence their policies um it the standard literature on campaign donations is they have very little effect in fact it's actually really hard to buy policies now but but the more subtler point is the following on any policy issue that the public notices and has an opinion on public wins <laughs> you know mm-hmm. public gets mm-hmm. their way regarding mm-hmm. policies the public can notice and attend to where other forces have their power is behind the scenes on things public doesn't even notice when there's a topic the public can't even be bothered to think about or understand it's too obscure too technical then politicians are wondering what to do and other people can come in and have a voice with them and influence them but the main influence is usually in terms of expertise about the technical details mm-hmm. they say look you could really screw this up if you if you get the technical details wrong and the public doesn't seem to care but I know a lot of these technical details. So if you listen to me, I can help you work out the details so you don't screw it up. And politicians are persuaded by that correctly, like you would be if you were in their role because they just they do not want to screw it up. They do not <laughs> want to be famous for the guy who screwed something up and gets the public attention. And so they listen a lot to firms and their experts behind the scenes because mm-hmm. they credibly do know a lot about the details. So that ability to get their ear on the details does give them some powers on the margin to push them one way or another when politician doesn't notice the public doesn't notice and they want it to go one way or another that's the fact of political influence in democracy in the modern world two main mm-hmm. channels when the public has an opinion they get what they want <laughs> and when the public doesn't care but there's some technical complexity the politicians are afraid of screwing up and politicians listen to technical experts which are usually you know aligned with mm-hmm. the companies who make stuff. Uh that's how our world works. So um is that happening a lot? Th- this has been happening for, you know, a century at least. This is how our democratic world works and has worked for a long time. If you want to talk about how we could make it work better, I'm happy to have that conversation, but at least the important thing is to understand how it works now. And it doesn't work too bad now. Um, now fundamentally when the public gets what they want they often screw things up i mean the public doesn't use doesn't always understand uh so for example if the public wanted to break up facebook or twitter or something right now they if they had that opinion strong enough well they could get their way mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they'd like what happened as a result <laughs> they may not understand very well the consequences of what they want but they would still get what they want and mm-hmm. partly that makes the public a little wary about demanding things cuz they know they don't know that much about the consequences of their actions who sh- who should be in charge of calling the shots because everything almost everything in our nature follows the bell curve and even human iq or 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 it's it's kind of a natural law so even if it's for decision making who do you think should call the shots D- definitely democracy is giving the power to give call the shots for everyone but who do you think should call the shots well i think you want to separate out the values and the facts so decision theory standard decision theory says that decisions are made on the basis of values i.e. preferences over outcomes and beliefs i.e. distributions over states of the world what's the world like so you want your decisions to have be trying to achieve good values but also be informed by you know a lot of knowledge and information about the facts that's what we want fundamentally so now unfortunately if you just are going to pick a person some people you could pick you might trust their values and other people you could pick you might trust their knowledge of the facts and now if you just have to pick one person you have to make a trade off here someone who you trust enough about the values but also hopefully you trust mm. enough to sort of get access to the facts but a better system is just to separate these two parts of governance just have separate parts of governance about the values and the facts and this is the basis of my proposal for a form of government called futarchy whose slogan yes. is vote on values but bet on beliefs <laughs> okay so in my proposal we have betting markets 
whose job is to aggregate beliefs about the facts, about the mm -hmm. consequences mm -hmm. of policies, and we have a separate mechanism for aggregating values, something more like a democracy, at least in the baseline proposal, and then we send people to the role of representing our values on the basis of thinking they understand and will stand for our values, but they don't stand for expertise on the facts. <laughs> it's a separate role for that. So I would say the key thing is, can we separate these two roles? Hmm. Can we have one role for the people who, whose values we think, you know, we trust that they will represent our values and another role for the people who will be the most informed about the facts mm -hmm. and reward them separately for these two separate roles and then combine the fact estimates that one group gets with the value estimate the other group gets to make decisions together. That is the ideal way to solve this problem. How true is the statement power corrupts in that? Well, it's about what kind of power, right? So mm -hmm. for example, in a betting market, Mm -hmm. A betting market rewards you for being right. Mm -hmm. So now if you have a, so now in order to get a lot of money, you will have to have a lot of information. So a betting market rewards you for getting information about the topic. So in that system, you know, if you have a way to get a lot of information, you get a lot of money, but that's not corrupt. If what we wanted from you was the information that is mm. corruption is about a divergence between what we wanted you to do and what you end up actually doing. So the mm. more we can set your incentives toward what we wanted, the less mm -hmm. corrupt you might mm. be. Mm. Corruption is about when we give you discretion such that the things you could try to achieve for your personal interests might be at odds with what we wanted you to do. And so mm -hmm. that's a matter of designing your incentives to setting up an institution where your incentives are aligned well with us so that when you do well by you, you do well by us. And that's a lot of what economics is about, is trying to set up and align incentives. So power is just the ability to do things. <laughs> Corruption is when there's a divergence in, you know, goals. And so the way to prevent power from corrupting is to set up the structure so that there isn't this divergence in the goals. Hmm. Interesting. But what about the other section of the values, not the betting? So... At the moment, we have legislatures that we elect. And mm -hmm. so that's a acceptable initial approach to aggregating values. That is often, you know, candidates for office will run on the platform of what values they represent. And then you can look at things they did to see whether they promoted those values. Now, in what I'm proposing, it gets easier to check whether they're promoting values because the things they do are directly value coded. At the moment, you see mm -hmm. legislators say they you know, value children and they pass some bill and you're supposed to figure out whether that's helping children and you don't know. So you don't know whether they represent represented your values in that action. But if what they're choosing is explicitly how much value to put on children and you elect them for that purpose, then you can more check whether they're doing the thing that you put them in that role to do. So mm. that's why separating these roles makes it easier to monitor them for whether they're achieving the values you set them for. Interesting, interesting. Uh, how big of a problem is income inequality? Because we've, this is the, like our current century is witnessing the highest amount of income shift or resource shift towards a very small percent of population. How big of a problem is that? I'm not sure it actually is that unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Looking for, I mean, tweet recently. Um, basically, inequality hasn't actually changed that much. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, I think it's gone down. Uh, but I think the main, so once upon a time, Inequality meant that the lower distribution of people were so poor they were starving and sick and, and like just physically miserable, right? The world's much richer now, so there's just much less of that. <laughs> there's much less of poorer people just being physically miserable than there used to be. Hmm. So now what there more is is envy. <laughs> uh, that okay. is, people with less feel disrespected. Uh, they see themselves as having lower status and disrespect and less respect and 
they don't like that. <laughs> and people with more are more respected, but they also feel a little guilty about the uh, fact that other people seem disrespected. So that's the fundamental issue to ask how, how important it is and what do we care. Um, individuals could directly do things about inequality through insurance. Insurance hmm. is, in fact, a straightforward mechanism for reducing inequality. Hmm. Um, in fact, we call most redistribution programs to reduce inequality social insurance, i.e. it's another social way to achieve insurance. Hmm. But a good reference point to ask is, how much insurance would individuals buy if they could easily buy insurance against inequality? Hmm. Okay. So, for example, you know, if, uh, you know, as a young person, you could have bought insurance against various risks in your life later on that, you know, so at the moment without insurance, you know, you, you try to have a family, you try to have a job, a career, you move different places. And then there's these various random things that happen. You might succeed in your career. You might fail. You might have a great family. You might have a bad family. You know, you might, your place where you live might prosper or it might not prosper. Those are all risks you're taking on. Hmm. as you live your life without insurance. And now we might ask if early on life we could say, well, would you like to buy some insurance so that in the states of the world where you have a successful career and your family does great and your you know, city does great, you'll lose some money. You'll have to pay some money in those situations. And then in the situ situations of the future where your career doesn't go so well, your family doesn't go so well, your city doesn't go so well, you would get paid in those situations. Hmm. That's what insurance would look like. And now we ask you, how much do you want to buy? And it seems like most people don't want to buy very much of that if it was just directly offered as insurance. Mm. That's the that's my main reference point. That is, if people were willing to buy a lot of insurance like that and somehow it weren't available, then I'd want to make sure it was available. Like if there was a way to make sure you could buy this insurance, well, yeah. And you want the insurance and it's valuable to you, then I want to make sure you can get it. But if the reason no, it, the insurance isn't there because nobody wants it, <laughs> Well, that means people don't that much mind this variation in the outcomes where some of them do better and some of them do worse. Mm -hmm. they, they, they really maybe would more like to roll the dice and see how well they can do or, you know, not have to pay the overhead of this insurance system. So yeah. that, that would be my main question about inequality is to what degree do individuals want to reduce their own future inequality mm -hmm. by basically buying insurance? And it but it seems like yeah. they don't want to buy it. They don't want to buy it much. Point I wanted to add is like, even though the quality of life has increased over the past five, six decades, the struggle people have to go through, for example, taking into account a normal family in America in the 1940s or the 50s, a single income would suffice the running of the family. But now coming to modern times in this year or this decade, even if two people are working one job, two job, it's hard to make both ends meet. The quality of life has improved. We certainly have heaters, AC, good apartments, all the amenities. But that time freedom, I think that's gone down. Imagine that you just tried to live the lifestyle of 1950 today in terms of your time allocation, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of in a couple who works and how many hours a day they work or things like that, okay? If they lived life that way, they would have less stuff, say, than other people who live a different way, who live more modern way today, but they'd have more stuff than the people did in 1950. Mm -hmm. So. You know, there's there's two directions to make the comparison. If you say, imagine someone in 1950, how they did live and how they allocated their time and what how much stuff they had and how much free time they had. And now imagine someone today who tries to live that same lifestyle. They're going to have more time and more stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's this other person today who's living a different lifestyle where they're working more. more correct. Right. And those people have more stuff today than the person who lives the 1950s lifestyle today. Correct. But that's a choice. <laughs> that hmm. is, they're choosing to get more stuff by working harder. And I don't know that I can tell them they're making the wrong choice. Maybe they're making the wrong choice. But, you know, if so, we should just tell them they're making the wrong choice. Oh, no, actually, my point was, if one person went to a nine to five job in the 1950s, 
it was well enough to run a family. But now, it even was well enough people... to run a family at the 1950s living standard. Okay. Okay. And if today you <laughs> had that same lifestyle, the same number mm-hmm. of hours a week, the same percentage of the family members working, etc., you could have a better life in terms of stuff, but it would be lower status compared to other people today. You'd be living on the margin, say. You wouldn't be living in the center of town, be living on the side. You wouldn't have as much stuff as other people. Maybe you have one car instead of two. Maybe you have mm. two bedrooms instead of four. Um, you would still have a better life than the people in 1950s had using that same lifestyle. But you would might envy the people today who work more hours and then have more stuff. So that's mm. the choice people are making today. So, as you may know, there's a famous essay by Keynes, who was a famous economist in the 1930s, okay. where he talked about what life would be like in a century. And he predicted people would work a lot fewer hours because now that they were rich, as rich as they were in the 1930s, he thought <laughs> you didn't need to work very many more hours because we were mostly done with working more hours because what we wanted to do was work less and have roughly the same stuff and have more free time. So he was just wrong. <laughs> people apparently wanted a lot more stuff than they had in 1930s. <laughs> And basically wanted to achieve that by working nearly as much as they did then. Mm. Or even more in terms of like women working. So, you know, once upon a time, men worked outside the home and women worked inside the home. But as we got a lot cheaper ways to manage households, we could afford to have the women work outside the home and and just use other th- other things to manage the household more cheaply. And that was a win from, from the people seemed to think that was a win. Hmm. But if they didn't want to do that, it would be possible to do, to go back. You'll just have to cut back relative to other people today, but you're still going to do better than people in 1950 or 1930 did mm-hmm. in terms of stuff. Lead a minimalist life and have more kids, people. Right. <laughs> well, the question is, is it a mistake? So this is a fundamental question about striving and status in our world. Mm-hmm. Many people do a lot of things for respect. Uh, they make more money for more respect. They work harder for more respect. They take on jobs that are more prestigious for more respect. Um, they you know, have fancier cars and furniture, houses for more respect, right? Um, people love respect. <laughs> That's always been true. But today, there's a different set of things you can do to gain respect, and people put a lot of effort into respect. Now, you could say, if you would just care less about respect and care more about (laughs) comfort or convenience or just, you know, free time and less stress and less anxiety, why you could have a life, a pretty nice life in terms of comfort and anxiety and stuff and time, you'll just get less respect. And you maybe you could tell people, that's not so bad. It's not so bad to have such a life with less respect, but they really want respect. And... That's why they're making these choices, to get the respect. Again, the elephant in the brain there might be uh, to pass on the genes, right? Because it's competition as as information evolves in the information era. Yeah, please. Right. Well, once upon a time, at least, respect would get you mates Mm. (laughs) uh, and higher quality mates and more children, right? So, but the question is, is it doing that so now? Or are your habits noticing the difference? So you see, the, so we talked about cultural evolution before. Like the key point is, generations ago, a long time ago, centuries ago, your behaviors were well matched to achieving, you know, evolutionary success because evolution had selected your culture. And when you just went along with your culture, that was effective at promoting your success, evolutionary success at your lineage. Um, now with culture just randomly drifting, (laughs) if you just follow your culture, it's no longer assured very much that you will in fact achieve more evolutionary success. In fact, we seem to be able to identify clear ways in which that's just wrong. Mm. If you wanted more evolutionary success, you should just have a lot more kids, even if other people around you don't respect you for that. (laughs) But we're deeply desiring of respect. And even though... It's actually not a very good evolutionary strategy at the moment to just maximize your respect. What we fundamentally do is follow our our desires, our loves, and we love respect. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. 
we should strive to fight against that in some level i guess i i was reading about this idea of view quakes in your ego can we expand on that so um if what you want to do is understand the world mhm and learn about the world then what you want is news <laughs> news is information that's especially surprising mm-hmm. so when you hear a piece of news but you would have predicted that it's not really very much news the sun rose this morning yes you expected the sunrise this morning it's hardly any news i mean it is news but it's very little <laughs> what you want is surprising news that's what is informative uh so now unfortunately many academics are interested in publishing papers that don't have much news <laughs> they like okay. the idea that their paper was kind of expected that the result they presented was kind of what you thought would happen and that's comforting to them because now they think people will believe them and trust them and that everybody will be reassured that their existing world view was correct and that's what people want but that's not news if you want to learn more about the world and update your views and and find out a lot more than you knew before you want surprising news news that right. you doubt you first wonder if that could be true you maybe have to even check to see if it's really true as opposed to fake news or something somebody made up or something that won't actually hold up under examination that's the kind of news you want cuz that's what's telling you the most hmm. so a view cake is that kind of news <laughs> big news that changes your mind about fundamental things and hmm. to the extent you are eager to learn about the world that's what you want the biggest quakiest pieces of news that change how you think about things. So I started to get addicted to those things in college because <laughs> in college there were a bunch of standard results that they could teach you that were in fact wildly unexpected. <laughs> you know, for example, relativity or quantum mechanics and physics. Uh cosmology even in physics. These were things that you know are very widely accepted within physics but a student is surprised to hear about them a lot of these things are in economics political science and social science there's a lot of things mm. people believe about the social world and once you learn specialist views about them you realize a lot of things people think are just way off those are view quakes that's updating that's what you want you want to and often if you learn a field for a while they start to run out of those things and that's what makes a polymath tempted to switch fields <laughs> is they're looking for more big view quakes more and and many of these things are in the most standard introductory classes hmm or textbooks you don't have to go searching out necessarily radical views among like people called radicals the most reliably radical stuff is going to be in the straightforward standard intro classes <laughs> and you just have to notice how unsurprising these things were compared to what you would have expected. I mean, these are the things you can most trust because these are the things these fields have tested and beat on the longest and still they hold up. Not only do they think they're true, they think it worth mentioning to you in introductory classes. So, yes. So, I would say the first thing you should do intellectually in your life is just read all the introductions to everything. Uh-huh. <laughs> learn all the introductions to everything because that's the most concentrated source of knowledge about all our different parts of the world is our concentrated standard introductions A- again i think it's the idea that the respect that we think we deserve and the idea of group think that sort of makes us shy away from this view quakes in an unconscious level well so right so learning about a surprise mhm can feel dangerous if you think the other people in your world don't learn about the surprise <laughs> and will then doubt you in terms of um whether they believe you and can rely on you so for example in my postdoc program uh, after i got my phd i did a postdoc in health policy and one of the main things i learned in health policy in the postdoc was that there's very little correlation between medicine and health And when I told that to my new colleagues here at George Mason, many of them thought that was very surprising and even doubtful and then doubted me <laughs> on the basis of my seeming to believe this crazy thing. So, uh you, you what so what you want to do is coordinate with other people to learn surprising things together <laughs> so that you can not be doubted by other people 
or you know, try to be reliable enough so that if you learn different surprising things, you can tell them to each other and then together learn even more surprising things. Mm, but that's a very thin line, you know, to make that community. Well, in some sense, this is an obstacle to us learning more together. Mm -hmm. That is, supposedly we have all these different people out there assigned to study different fields and their job is to go learn more about that field and tell us what they've learned, but they're reluctant to tell us surprising things because we might doubt whether they really know anything. And so unfortunately, <laughs> they might just tell us what we expect to hear, even if they've learned something different. And this is true all through the world. If you want to have experts in subjects, there's the key question of, do you trust them enough for them to tell you something surprising? And if they know that you don't trust them that much, then they're not going to tell you things surprising. And so <laughs> what are you buying? Why pay for an expert to tell you things if they're just going to tell you what they think you expect to hear? There's, you might as well just stick with your own expectations. The only reason to hire someone to be an expert is if you're willing to listen to them when they tell you something different from your initial expectations. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. But if you don't trust them enough to do that, just don't even have experts. There's no point. <laughs> Maybe it's a good idea to incentivize culture to hunt for black swans. Well, the question is how to incentivize culture. So <laughs> okay. Many, many people claim that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you know, they have an incentive to claim that they're going to give you surprising information, but also stay away from things that might make you doubt them. <laughs> so the hard question is how can you pay an expert so that they will tell you surprising things? Because if you could believe surprising things, that will be the biggest update on your world. Now, we should get to the very basic point here. Many people don't actually want to know surprising things. So mm. in our world, we have many specialist experts like professors, etc. And we give them prestige for their expertise. And we give other people prestige for affiliating with them. So people get prestige by getting a degree in, say, economics from prestigious professors. And what people want is the prestige. And they don't necessarily want the surprises, <laughs> especially about, say, things like society and social behavior, where they just have a thing, bunch of things they already want to believe and they think they already know everything. Hmm. And then they don't want surprises. They don't because they don't even want to believe them. And they fear those surprises will take away from their prestige and their willing ability to get other people yeah. to believe them. So there's large areas of experts who don't actually tell people much surprising because what people want is to affiliate with prestige, not to actually learn surprising things. Yeah, I had a guest on, we talked about creativity a lot, and uh, a point that we came to conclusion was that our brains are wired to be lazy. It wants to take the path of least resistance, right? Uh, in some ways, but not always. I mean, uh -huh. in some ways we want the packs of max resistance, that is when we're trying to be impressive. <laughs> so often, People like complicated explanations and complicated demonstrations, and they won't respect simple ones because what they're trying to do is be impressive, not actually informative. Okay. So there are many ways. I mean, you were just talking about that earlier, right? How people work hard, even when they <laughs> don't have to work so hard. And they're, right. what they're mainly doing is impressing people, <laughs> showing that they can work hard and can do more. And they can you know, have more money, more prestigious positions. That's what they're working hard to do. So they're doing the opposite of lazy. Mm -hmm. Often we don't respect someone who achieves a lot if it seems it was too easy for them. We want to respect people who seem to be working very hard and struggling to achieve things. Which is why right. they often try <laughs> to achieve things through difficult means. Exactly, exactly. How important is it that then we should include first principle thinking? How, how are we educating people for first principle thinking? Well, again, the risk is that you'll conclude the wrong things. <laughs> okay. So, so there are many areas of society where there's a bunch of shared beliefs that, you know, the newspapers reaffirm and, you know, dinner parties reaffirm and that everybody agrees that this is what we should all believe. And then it's dangerous to go dig into those areas more because you're quite likely to discover things at odds with those shared beliefs. Uh, especially if you use first principles, because most the, most shared beliefs are not based on first principles. <laughs> so if you go using first principles, you're quite likely to form beliefs at odds with these shared beliefs. And now you are at risk of being rejected and not believed and seeming to be a, a disloyal betrayer of shared values by having inappropriate beliefs. So mm. 
that's the risk of first principles. How, how do we solve that? Um, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Or that does it require a solution at all? Even that may be a better question. <laughs> that is, we know how sub-communities can put a higher priority on truth and actually mm -hmm. believe more truths. What mm -hmm. we don't know how to do is get other people to accept or respect them mm. <laughs> so much. So, so, for example, you know, a big part of my life has been prediction markets, i.e. there are many topics on which if we have a betting market, we get a more accurate estimate. Mm. But many people don't like prediction markets exactly because they produce more accurate estimates well, that then are in conflict with the other things they wanted to say and believe. Exactly. So... It isn't a problem so much of knowing how to be more accurate and be hmm. more truthful and more first principle oriented, etc. We know many ways to do these things. What we don't know how to do is to make people like it. Well, that was Professor Robin Hansen on The Seeker's Mind Talks. If you all enjoyed the show, don't forget to support us with your likes and comments. Until next time, this is your host Raj signing off from the Seekers Mind Talks. <laughs>